Good afternoon. This is David Unsworth, host of the Pan Am Post English Language Podcast. This week, major Democratic Party donor Tom Steyer upped the stakes for congressional Democrats, calling on them to make impeachment proceedings against Donald Trump a cornerstone of their messaging and policy in the run-up to the 2018 midterm elections, now just a bit over a year away. Tom Steyer is a California hedge fund manager based in San Francisco. He's the founder of Farallon Capital, which has over $20 billion under management and has an estimated personal net worth of $1.6 billion. Uh, the media has often played him up to be something of the Democratic counterpart to the billionaire Koch brothers who uh, have major investments in uh, petroleum products, uh, paper products, minerals, even cattle ranching. Uh, in fact, Tom Steyer is now the single largest donor in American politics. He spent uh, an estimated $74 million on the 2014 election cycle, and uh, 2016 cycle he spent $91 million. Uh, that, that's even for someone with a net worth of $1.6 billion, that is hardly chump change. He, he spent 10% of his net worth uh, over the last two election cycles. What is really setting uh, seems to be uh, transpiring here is a battle between the uh, mainstream Democrats and the liberal activist base of the Democratic Party. Uh, the mainstream Democrats have said, could this strategy really backfire? I mean, is this what we want to be making a top priority, the impeachment of Donald Trump? Uh, thus far, uh, two congressional Democrats, uh, Brad Sherman from California and Al Green from Texas, have uh, introduced articles of impeachment uh, into the House. Uh, Al Green, who represents a Houston-based district in Texas, uh, has included among his reasons for impeaching Trump the response to the uh, Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, uh, Trump's attacks on the NFL and its players, and the accusations uh, by Donald Trump that President Ota Obama was involved in wiretapping Trump Tower. Uh, uh, with all due respect to Al Green, these would appear to fall short of the high crimes and misdemeanors that the Constitution specifies. Uh, Maxine Waters, a California Democrat, said uh, a few weeks ago that it is up to the uh, Congress to determine what constitutes high crimes and misdemeanors. And, uh, yeah, in a sense, she's right. It, it is a vague term, uh, and uh, it, it, the, the Constitution sets out a, a few, uh, few items, such as, for example, treason as impeachable offenses, but high crimes and misdemeanors uh, does not have a iron-clad definition, a clear-cut definition. And in fact, uh, as many uh, political and legal commentators have suggested, you could conceivably have a case where something is an impe impeachable offense that is not a crime. Uh, now, of course, with the Republicans controlling uh, both chambers of Congress, uh, impeachment is not going anywhere. If they were to win back the Senate and the House in 2018, which seems very unlikely, well, then, you know, the ball might get rolling on this. The, the issue of impeachment could be back on the table. But, as I've pointed out repeatedly, the Senate map is most unfavorable to Democrats. There are something along the lines of eight or nine senators, who, Democratic senators, who are up for your election in red states, won by Donald Trump, and the Republican Party has actually fielded uh, pretty strong candidates in some of these races. So, yes, there's an incredible amount of outrage on uh, the, the, the activist base of the Democratic Party. Will that mean that they have a good shot at taking back the Senate or the House? Well, that remains to be seen. So, back to Tom Steyer. This is a, uh, a lot of different uh, publications have been writing about this. This is a big story. Uh, Steyer is upping the stakes here. And Steyer addresses 
uh, three main components of his argument for impeaching Trump. Uh, number one will come as no surprise to anyone, the Trump's alleged relationship with Vladimir Putin and Russia, uh, allegations of Trump collusion. Now, on this front, there is still no smoking gun, as I've been pointing out for four months now. Uh, if, if we were to find a smoking gun, a document, a text message, an email, uh, a, a, a recorded conversation, something to suggest that Donald Trump was personally involved, or, or even some of his campaign associates were involved in working together with the Russian government to hack the DNC's emails or to change vote tallies, that is an impeachable offense. I don't think anyone disputes that. As I've said before, Trump, with all his faults and foibles, I do not think that even if Trump was deviant, devious enough to collude with the Russian government, I don't think he's stupid enough to allow such a document or such a conversation or email or what, what, whatever it may be to come into existence. Uh, the, the, the most serious uh, uh, charge that, that Trump's opponents who are discussing impeachment have leveled against him is this charge of obstruction of justice. But a lot of this involves uh, Comey's testimony before Congress. It's Trump's word against Comey's word. Uh, uh, and on a, on a hilarious late-night talk-related side note, we were treated to an Orwellian moment <laughs> where Stephen Colbert informed his live TV audience that Comey had been fired, and they started to cheer, and Comey, uh, they started to cheer Comey's firing, and Colbert had to admonish them and tell them that, uh, no, it was actually a very bad thing, and they were, they were Trump fans, and then they changed their tune. I mean, it was kind of an Orwellian moment. Um, regarding an, an obstruction of justice charge, uh, the first thing that Republicans and Trump defenders and supporters are going to say is, well, there's a weak case for obstruction of justice, and even so, it, it's obstruction of justice into an inquiry that has it constitutes baseless allegations. There is no smoking gun, there is no proof, there is no evidence. As Dianne Feinstein said a few months ago, we have not found anything yet. Uh, what, what, is, what is happening now is that they're investigating Paul Manafort for uh, illicit enrichment because of his ties with the Ukrainian government. But uh, John and Tony Podesta, big wigs in the Democratic Party, we're also in, involved in, in numerous lobbying efforts uh, for monetary gain involving the Ukrainian government. Uh, Tom Steyer's uh, second reason involves promoting his own business interests during his tenure as president. There's something called the Foreign Emoluments Clause in the Constitution. And this charge to me is rather preposterous. Um, Article 1 of the Constitution prohibits, quote, a person holding any office of profit or trust under them from accepting, quote, any present emolument office or title of any kind whatever from any king, prince, or foreign state. Now, this, <laughs> Trump is a real estate and tourism guy. He has uh, hotels all over the world and so forth. Now, the notion that Foreign dignitaries staying in Trump hotels would constitute uh, violating this Foreign Emoluments Clause of the Constitution. Uh, it just seems preposterous to me. Uh, people working for foreign governments have the freedom to stay in any hotels they want. Uh, is it possible that because Trump is president they would feel pressured or they, they would have motivation to stay in, in Trump hotels? Really, okay, it's possible, but it, unless there is some proof that Donald Trump is going to foreign dignitaries, visiting foreign embassies, and leaning on them heavily to rack up big bills at his hotel chain, I mean, this is just preposterous. There's no way, even if Democrats take back the House and the Senate, 
and conduct an investigation. This charge is going nowhere. This is not going to fly with the American public. Because Trump has hotels and because people working for foreign governments stay, th stay in them, that does not constitute a, 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 a violation of Article 1 of the, of the Constitution. I mean, that's, that is beyond preposterous. The third issue that Tom Steyer raises is his, quote-unquote, seeming determination to go to war. And he is flabbergasted. He is up in arms about Trump's, uh, uh, Trump and his potential to start a nuclear war. Uh, a nuclear war with North Korea does not actually appear likely. What has appeared likely, what, what would be the most serious military engagement, would be some kind of counterproductive and disastrous military build-up or even engagement with Russia between the West and the East, the EU and the US on one side, and Russia and its uh, ragtag hodgepodge of, of satellite states throughout the world on the other. Uh, you know, one of the best things that Trump has done thus far is steer us in the opposite direction. I mean, I know things haven't been all rosy with, between Trump and Putin, and Trump is now trying... He, the last thing he wants to do is let people think that he's cozying up to Russia, but uh, the last thing on Earth that the world needs right now is another Cold War between the European Union and the U.S. and Russia. I mean... It's funny to me that Tom Steyer is so concerned about Donald Trump's tweets regarding North Korea, but he's not concerned about Cold War, World War III, between the two traditional superpowers in the world. Obviously, we, are, we now have China to deal with. Many would argue they are now the third superpower. But uh, Trump is not in the wrong here on North Korea. Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump are not moral equivalents. Uh, Donald Trump has every right to lay out to the North Korean government that any attack on us is going to be met with massive retaliation of a nuclear nature. I have no problem with that. I mean, I'm a hardcore libertarian. I do not want foreign military adventurism around the world. But when it comes to a regime that is as barbaric and brutal and dictatorial as Kim Jong-un, I mean... The, the only two leaders that come to mind in, in recent times with that level of insanity are Muammar Gaddafi in Libya, Kim Jong-un. It, it, I've perused uh, the several dozen treats Trump has sent out related to North Korea. Uh, no, that, that's not what's pushing us to the brink of nuclear war. What's pushing us to the brink of nuclear war is that uh, Kim Jong-un has developed nuclear weapons and... He, he is committing offenses against his own people that rival anything that uh, Hitler or Stalin or Mao Zedong ever did. Um, as of now, uh, the Democrats, uh, the mainstream Democrats at least, are uh, a bit hesitant to go along with this uh, left-wing uh, liberal activist base uh, tide, if you will. And they may also want to heed the warnings of the past. In 1868, Andrew Johnson was impeached by the radical Republicans, but his impeachment was not confirmed by the Senate. The same thing happened in 1998 to Bill Clinton. His, uh, Bill, and Bill Clinton uh, was impeached by the House for obstruction of justice on an irrefutable charge of committing perjury in an investigation. Now, the Democrats said, well, this was an investigation into Monica Lewinsky. It was politically motivated and never should have happened to begin with. Fair enough, but Bill Clinton did commit a crime, and uh, he committed perjury. That, that, the, nonetheless, it backfired spectacularly. It, it proved very politically unpopular for the Republicans, they did not get a single Democratic vote in the Senate. They need 67 votes to confirm the impeachment. And uh, it was not successful. Adam Schiff, uh, the, the ranking Democrat in the House Intelligence Committee, has said, quote, uh, an impeachment drive shouldn't be perceived as an effort to nullify the election by other means. Now, on the other hand, you have uh, 
some people running for, for down ballot races, governorships, Senate seats. For example, J.B. Pritzker, who's a top Democratic money man and who's running for governor of Illinois, has said, quote, we simply do not have the luxury of time to wait for months or years to, deper- to determine whether the current president of the United States has committed high crimes and misdemeanors. The House must begin the impeachment process before Donald Trump puts us at risk again. Well, puts us at risk again of what? I mean, of, of not doing enough on climate change, of starting a nuclear war with, with North Korea, of overturning uh, Obama's government takeover of health care? Uh, what, what is the risk here? Donald Trump is opposing the Democrats' agenda. I mean, that, that appears to be the real risk here. Uh, Dick Durbin, who is one of the most high-ranking Democrats in the Senate, one of the leaders of the party, was uh, is tacking on a much more moderate position. He said, quote, they, they wanted, they being liberal activists in the party, they wanted the president gone on November the 10th of last year. I want to make certain that we follow the law, follow the Constitution, do it in an orderly way, and not to get into a crazed political crusade at this point. Uh, fair enough. Um, you know, there a huge factor that plays into all of this, the Koch brothers, Tom Steyer, uh, which direction are both part, major parties going to take in their strategy, is a Supreme Court decision called Citizens United, which basically opened the floodgates to uh, rather uh, generous, uh, unlimited spending by individuals under certain capacities. There are limits to what you can give directly to uh, political candidates running for Congress, for the presidency, and so forth. But through PACs and super PACs and, and various public policy advocacy groups, co- contributions are virtually unlimited. So that, that is why the Koch brothers can pour hundreds of millions of dollars into politics, and uh, George Soros and Tom Steyer can do it on the left as well. Now, I, as a libertarian, uh, I agree with the Citizens United decision. It I think that political contributions are free speech protected by the First Amendment. And uh, the, the issue here is not getting money out of politics. It's making sure that it's transparent. We can see who's giving money for what reason. And obviously, uh, we do need to be vigilant about quid pro quos. There, there's no question about that. But to just say... Uh, the government is going to take over funding of elections is as preposterous to me as just saying, well, we'll solve the, our problem in American democracy by ordering everyone to vote. Uh, it, it's, not going to, it's not going to change anything. I mean, there are always going to be ways for those on the left and the right to use their uh, financial clout to influence elections. Uh, we should accept that as reality. Now, the big and, and and obviously you know when you have someone like Tom Steyer jumping into the fray with 160 million dollars in less than four years, that somewhat dilutes uh, criticism of the Koch brothers for perverting our democracy or buying our democracy. Uh, it's happening on both ends of the political spectrum, and uh, barring overturning the Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court, it's going to stay that way. So. The future of the Democratic Party the, will be determined by the 2018 midterm elections. Uh, is it possible that uh, Tom Steyer will fund a new wave of uh, left-wing candidates who will very, very, very vociferously press their party leadership to pursue an impeachment of Trump? Well, my take on it is that without a smoking gun, without a solid smoking gun linking Trump to collusion and paving the way for a a, a solid case for an obstruction of justice charge, that's not going to happen. This has been David Unsworth with the Pan Am Post English Language Podcast. Thanks for listening.